you may not make it right away because it doesn't really happen for everyone else at the same time but if you really do pay your dues and like do these things it will come this is the creative voyage podcast a long-form interview show with the mission to help creative professionals to level up i'm your host mario de picolzuane I'm a creative professional myself, active in the fields of graphic design, art direction, and creative consulting. In this podcast, I present in-depth interviews with some of the world's most inspiring creative professionals, revealing the stories that shape their lives and careers, plus actionable strategies to help you take your mindset and skills to the next level. I invite you to join me on this journey. Before we dive into the episode, a quick update on one of our recent initiatives. Towards the end of last year, we've teamed up with industry leaders and dear friends to create an actionable and inspirational publication, which distills what the Creative Voyage podcast is all about. In the first issue of the Creative Voyage paper, you'll find adapted podcast episodes, three publication-exclusive one-lesson-learned features, and tips for success. It's beautifully printed and features Zong Lin, Jonas Bierre Polson, Aiki Kuning, Tia Albert Smith, Fukiko Takase, Youth Studio, and many others. Visit creative.voyage to get your copy. In this episode, I talk to a fashion stylist. Hi, my name is Jermaine Daly. I'm based in New York and I'm a fashion stylist. Jermaine Daly is a New York based fashion stylist. His work focuses on storytelling and creating characters through styling and editing. One of his signature strengths is use of color, which is inventive, bold, and sophisticated, inspired by his childhood in Jamaica. Editorial clients include Interview Magazine, Kinfolk, L'Officiel, Mission, Behind the Blinds, and The Last Magazine, to name a few. In this episode, we're going to listen to the highlights of the conversation I had with Jermaine in October 2020. We cover topics such as career tips for beginner stylists, challenges Jermaine encountered along the way, his approach to fashion styling, managing finances, sustainability in fashion, and much more. Jermaine loved clothes from a young age. However, it took some time for him to find his way and understand what he wanted to do. Even though that passion directed him to start studying fashion, he wasn't too excited about being a fashion designer. In his early 20s, he started working in retail instead and explored other fashion avenues through freelance and part-time gigs, always keeping busy. During those years, he interned with two different celebrity stylists, which gave him the first real taste of what fashion was. It was hard work and an opportunity to find his place in the industry. In 2015, as a freelancer working closely with the editors at the Interview Magazine, Things started clicking for him, and he decided to pursue his career as a fashion stylist. Through patient and directed work and collaborations, slowly but surely he began to work on his projects and network, elevating his professional skills along the way, which, as he told me, is a long and ongoing process. I began my conversation with Jermaine, asking him about the advice he would give his younger self during those early days as suggestions for stylists who are just starting their professional journeys. I think one of the things that I would really tell myself is to like really push, just push for more, you know, because at that time I wasn't pushing for as much as I could have been doing, you know, and I, I think there was certain opportunities that was almost given to me and I kind of denied a couple of them at the time just because I was like not really comfortable with the idea of it. And I think, for me, if I had to say, go back and say, I would be like, you know what, take the chance. You never know where it may lead, you know? Yeah. And I didn't really take a full chance during that time when I first really started. And I really wish I'd taken more of a chance with myself and like really pushed the idea that I could really like be in this industry fully. And, and I'm in the in- industry fully, you know, I've worked with quite a lot of editors and like really good ones and, you know, from different backgrounds and like, different publications so like I know I could have had more of a push but I think that's the one thing I would have told myself a little earlier push a little bit more you know yeah and why do you think you were on that little bit of a conservative side I guess do you know why why were you holding back 
I think most of it was the part about not knowing to do everything was one of the ideas, was one of the things in my brain. I'm a perfectionist and I think being a perfectionist is really, really hard because if you feel like you can't do something, you won't really do it necessarily. And I think for me, I was such that person who wanted to be perfect at everything and I didn't really want to push unless I was perfect at it, you know, like I didn't want to chase something not knowing how to do it very well. And I think for me, over time, I worked on, like, I try to work on what I understood, like, you know, even about doing market work, which market work entails me going through publicists and getting clothes. And that took me a little bit of time to understand how to get around it, which I was really like, you know, most of my friends that I know, they were so involved in pushing forward that and I just didn't do that at a time. And I think it was my nerves getting to me. but. I think the idea of just being a perfectionist for myself really affected most of what I could have done, Yeah, but not really to that full extent. And I think, you know, obviously having like a full-time job at the time was also another big reason why I didn't really push myself too much was because I, I wanted to like stay financially stable, you know, and not go into a part of the world where I may not have the same financial background. So I think those two things really took a halt on what the idea behind what I should have been doing was. Yeah. Do you consider yourself to be a perfectionist at the moment? Yes. I'm a very, very big perfectionist in terms of, I really like things to really be, I'm meticulous about a lot of things. Like I'm meticulous about the places I eat, how my food is presented to me, how my drinks are presented to me. My work, I'm very big on that. Like, I don't like things to like look messy too much. Intended messy is a little bit different from if it's actually messy, you know. So, like, and I think I've just also come from the zone of like working with editors who are the same way in a way. So, like, I get that mentality that things have to be perfectly placed. Yeah. But yeah, I find myself to be a very big perfectionist. I may not be perfect in the real bigger picture. But I think I like things around me to be as perfect as possible. And I know perfection is obviously a thing that is unobtainable at most times. But I think just from your mental state and knowing that something could be perfect in a certain way in your mind, that's what I look at. You mentioned at the beginning, one of the reasons was also that perfection holding you back and I guess the lack of certain confidence in the field. How do you like now kind of balance that? Because I mean, of course you do have more experience, but usually with more experience and certain progress, you can also learn more and realize other gaps or places where you can enhance or, or level up again. So I'm curious, how do you like balance those things? Because I feel like perfectionism can be for a lot of people, almost like something that is holding them back in a sense. It can be quite like an obstacle. So how, how do you like balance that? I think right now, I just have like a idea in my head that everything will not, not necessarily be perfect. I try to get it as perfect as possible as I want it to be. But I think working with other people now is like a thing that you have to put into play. And I think a lot of how even my work take place is that I have to remember that it's not only me that's creating this work that I'm doing. There is a group of people that are on the same idea span as I am. So I really have to understand now that it's always not possible to have things be perfect, you know, because you're, you're not doing it yourself all the time. Yeah. And I really just kind of working with a group, I think, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit trying to like put this out right. But I think working with a group, I learned to understand that I just need to be happy at the end with the results that I've obtained. And, you know, obviously if I could try to make something as the best as possible, I will, but if it's not possible, like I just have to reimagine it in a way where it's possible that that becomes perfect, you know? You're trying to make sure that you do your absolutely best? Yeah, exactly. And then if it mismatches the vision in some sense, you can still be like, okay, I did my best. I had the best people I could have around and there was all these circumstances and it's good <laughs> in the end. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and that's, that's a big thing in this industry. The circumstances that we work under is very, very different than your normal day life as a nine to five worker. Like our circumstances mm -hmm. are very much 
based on end results. We don't really have, like you could bring it to the table like so many ideas, but at the end, it may not turn out the way that you thought it was going to turn out. Either it's the makeup, the hair, the model, the photographer, the stylist, the location, like all these things really do permit to what our work end up being towards the end because nothing is ever perfect. You know, we're always going to encounter one thing that's going to like kind of stricken us to what we think perfection should be. Yeah. There's always, it's just like nature. Nature is not perfect. Nature has its moments and we can't ever think it's going to be perfect always. And following the thread of giving your younger self a piece of advice, what advice would you give to a young person who is entering the field of uh, fashion styling? I think for me, I would tell someone really come in with a mindset that you're going to do it and you're not going to stop until you get where you want to get and you're going to understand every single aspect of what your job should and could be because you never stop learning what this job is you learn things as you go all the time like there's just so many different situations that you've learned that this is how something could be done or like you, you're just not, no one ever stops learning you know it's like anyone would tell you even like an older person you never stop learning things in life because life continues to improve and to change so having a mentality that you cannot give up because you're not seeing results in the first, you know, maybe year or so, like results come later. You just have to continue to push and to grind and to really make yourself more knowledgeable of what you're doing because knowledge is power. Yeah. And if we like imagine like a, a situation, theoretical, but it's probably there are actually people like there in that situation at the moment where let's say somebody's just finishing their studies or has like a maybe they finished or are finishing and they look up to you and they're like okay i really like what he's been doing and it's they can relate and they're like oh i want to go into that direction like and they have a question of how should i go about it what would you suggest a good suggestion is to if you really like that person there's always instagram or email i feel like a lot of people that i hear about now i had an intern that I'm, i'm currently working with still and you know he found me on instagram and he reached out to me by email and really you just have to connect yourself with that person if that's that person that you really will want to like be your guidance in a way reach out to them can i intern for you you know is there any way for us to have a conversation i would love to like get coffee and chat with you about like how for me to enter into this field, you know, and most times these people are, they're really willing to like help you out, especially if you're suggesting, I want to intern for you for a couple months and to really understand what your job is. That's a great way to really get into this industry is first of all, knowing who you want to be or knowing what your work want to be. It's the same for any single person. Like, photographers, hair and makeup. If you want to learn something, you have to find someone who could help you and teach you. If you want to break in this industry, ask whoever work you're looking at and you like something. Like if you look in a magazine, because before, this is also a good thing to say, but before when I used to look in magazines, there used to be a lot of work that I used to like. But my one mistake was that I never really paid attention to names because I'm so bad at names in general. And I never paid attention to the stylists or the photographers' names that would appear in these magazines all the time. Because it was, for me, I'm so horrible at name, like I can never remember people's names so easily. So I think for you looking in a magazine and you see, oh, I, I always like, for instance, this ID magazine, I always like this style and artist photography type. And you, you just keep reading those people's names. And that's also how you could find whose work you're interested in. You know, like, what are you really interested in? Kind of research those people that you kind of see, you like their work. Give them a look, like, look them up, trying to find what other works they've done that you may like and get an idea in the head of who you want to work for as well, you know? As the author Annie Dillard reminds us, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. What we do with this hour and that one is what we're doing. To get a better insight into Germain's work and the craft of fashion styling, I've asked him to share his current work routines and practices. A lot of work that I do is specifically for brands and like whether it's their e-com or like an editorial that they want to do or a campaign. So like these small little things are 
kind of like my average week. And what goes into a lot of that is that I gather my thoughts and like whatever I'm doing, I, I show up to work and like normally I show up to work and I kind of get a walkthrough through my clients about what's going on, what do we need to do, what are we creating, just the idea behind what they want to see and end result and just gathering all the information that I could possibly get and like, you know, like I start to style and like I start to like try different things and and a lot of it is when I'm working for like a client, like in terms of a brand, Mm -hmm. I'm working with what their clothes is. So I'm not really necessarily picking clothes out of thin hair from other people. I'm working with what they give me. And I kind of create uh, idea, the ideas that they want to entail, like whether it's like a mood board that they've already have an idea, like, you know, we want to evoke happiness in the styling or like fun colors, like just this based on ideas. Yeah. From what I get from a client, you know, like I create looks and like, you know, looks meaning like, you know, like a full outfit for the model or for whoever the case is. And it goes a lot like that. And obviously, like most times I do it like a a pre day, which, you know, it's just me and my assistant and we style out everything and we kind of like go over with the client and, you know, see what they think see what could be changed, you know, the idea behind also retail is that most clients have this idea what they buy into and what's their main pushes for the season, you know, so really, a lot of that is mentally understanding what the client needs and fully giving it to them on that side. And then on the editorial side, a lot of my work comes from like I build some of my own mood boards for some magazines or for like, not some magazines, but for right now for like one main magazine, I build an idea of what I want to do for this season of shows that I saw. Yeah. And I really, I get excited by clothes personally. I will never really stop being excited to see clothes. I'm just a genuine lover of clothes and like what clothes could be and should be mm-hmm. whenever I see a runway show, for instance, like, you know, we have fashion week that's kind of going on. I don't really know if it's really going on. Shows are still coming out, but those runway shows are where you kind of like see and you kind of get an idea. You're like, oh, this will be great in this scenario, meaning like setting, like I want to do someone in the fields running in this dress, like just like an idea of what you really come across. So for me, I create a mood board based on what I've seen this season or what I would like to see. And then I kind of go about and I find the clothes or the brands that would be great to like get this idea rolling. And I start to go through that process of finding what the clothes is, finding where I could get them. I request them from the brand about three to five days prior, depending on the location of the magazine that I'm working for. If it's a U.S. publication and I'm going through the US market, I could request it up until a day before, maybe a couple of days, and I may get lucky. But normally, I do a full week dealing with like publicists and trying to work out whether they're able to like loan me samples from any of these brands that I work with, and kind of like a, a back and forth. And then we get the clothes in, we have like a full day of getting everything picking ups and organizing our day before the shoot. And then we go into set the next day and we create beautiful pictures. And the process is is like me kind of making my final edits with the photographers and seeing what is the best result for what we could produce, like what works best, you know, what idea behind clothes that are we going to like choose here? Yeah. And let's say on, on a specific shoot, usually how prepared are you or like, do you already have like we're doing, I don't know, this 10 looks and it's probably going to be like this. And like, how then does that like translate to the shoot or do you improvise? Like, how, how does that work? So what I do is normally I'll get like a 10 page story. For instance, I will request about 50 brands <laughs> in terms for clothes. Okay, 50. And I'll kind of make like a very big edit. Like, yeah, 50 brands or maybe sometimes more. Okay. For me, I don't really like to go too much. We do get a lot of clothes. We do get a lot of clothes when we work. So I think the main idea of why we get this many things a lot of times is that most times we see things on a runway or we see things in a lookbook 
And, you know, we think it may work, but we get on set and we start to take a picture of it and it doesn't translate to what you thought it was going to translate to. So you always like to have alternative options just in case something doesn't work out. Yeah. And I think the idea behind brands giving you clothes is that sometimes something that you requested is may not be available and, you know, you may not want anything else from that collection. So you request these alternative brands and you try to figure out who's going to have what is possible for you that you could use. And also the next thing is that when you're working with a publication that has a set of advertisers, you have to normally prioritize their advertising lists before you prioritize any additional brands. And if you possibly get these things from their advertisers, which most times you will, you shoot as much as you can from the advertising list that they've given you, whether it's like, we needed to shoot Armani, Prada, you know, Gucci, Saint Laurent, like all these things. And yeah. whatever picture is left over, if I, if I give you 10 credits and, you know, you didn't get a good look from three of the credits, you could filter something in that's not necessarily a credit for them or not an advertiser for them. But you could filter in a couple other brands or, you know, maybe you like an accessory from one of these brands that's not an advertiser and you're able to mix it in with the advertising brands, whether it's a shoe, a hat, like, you know, like something like even a t-shirt. Yeah. So it's really like a full blown idea to really get what your work is around, you know? When you're on a shoot, obviously you're either on location or in the studio, but on other days when you're preparing, like how does your workspace look? Do you have an office or do you do something else? My workspace is normally my home. I normally work from home or Mm -hmm. I'm always kind of on the go. I mean, even if I'm not working, I'm kind of always outside. If it's not too cold, especially, I always try to like be outside just because I, I don't like to stay in my house too much. <laughs> it's just like a weird thing. But I'm either working at home or I work actually a lot of my iPhone, which my iPhone is actually amazing to get a lot of the work that I need to get done. So I'm normally either I'm on a train and I'm still getting work done on my, my phone because most times for me, I use my phone personally. Even when I'm working, I use my phone a lot more than my computer. Okay. And if I'm home, I use my computer to like do a bigger kind of like perfect everything. Like I either need to put a PDF together for someone or I need to like finalize a couple like things in terms of a mood board. Like I do it on my computer because my computer, obviously it's a bit more practical in that way. But a lot of my workspace is my home and sometimes there's an office that I use or I borrow, but I mostly use it for when I'm getting in the clothes and I will will go there and have all the clothes sent there. Yeah. But yeah, mostly for my home. Yeah. And and how do you work alone or do you do you often work with collaborators? How the, how is that distributed? I normally have an assistant that helps me out for editorial purposes, most times, you know, because editorial most time doesn't really pay you're doing it for really nothing so it's quite costly to do an editorial so i try to do as much as possible on my own if i can and then i'll get an assistant in and if i'm busy with another job i will kind of have an assistant take over for me or my assistant take over and handle the market and like i'll tell them hey i would love you to find really like nice fine jewelry Or like, hey, I would love you to find this specific type of shoe and give that person an idea of what I need and they will execute the rest of it. Yeah. In terms of collaboration, I mean, mostly, yes, I do collaborate with people, but most of it for me at this current point in my career necessarily, I'm, I'm doing it on my own for bringing the idea to life and clothes wise. I'm doing it on my own a lot. I don't know. I'm a very self-efficient person in terms of like getting things done on my own. And I've always been that way, which is not very, which sometimes is not the best way to work, but it works for me just because like I know time frame for myself. And like, if I have to get something done, I'm going to get it done in the time that I need to get it done, you know? And before you mentioned a little bit about your schedule during the day, but how long are your like work days on average? Sometimes from like a... Maybe a 10-hour day normally. For editorials, I could say it could be run up to a 12-hour day. So 10 to 12 hours a day is normally my work day. <laughs> yeah. And do you have like uh, weekends or is it like the shoots happen on a weekend? How, how is that? Do, do you manage to have like a certain kind of routine in your schedule or 
Weekends, I don't frequently work on weekends unless it's maybe editorial because I, I like personally love to like do my editorials on a weekend because it's not like a working day normally. Because if I'm doing a client job, they'll normally have their shoots during the weekdays. Not to say they won't have a weekend, but majority of the jobs I've ever worked on, it's been on a weekday. So I normally do have my weekends off unless it's like really something specific. Yeah. And I do my editorials on a weekend whenever I have one. But normally weekends, I do have off to myself. I aim for the same thing. Or if I do something, I aim to have something more fun or something more on the side or like a side project or something self-initiated. Yeah, exactly. You know, side projects on weekends are not really bad because it just feels like it's not really taken away because it's something you necessarily want to do for fun. Yeah. And especially if you can like involve like some of your like friends or people you would like to work with and it can be yeah quite a good way to like work on yourself and your skills on like let's say yeah on off time but still it contributes overall to your work yeah exactly there's i mean different facets of what you're doing from being on a shoot to like sourcing to i mean research there's administration so how is that distributed research uh, you know i should have mentioned that in, the, in my last answer or last topic But research is a very big part of my job. For editorial purposes, research is one of the main things that I think that a lot of people depend on because, you know, it's it's actually like you are creating like an idea behind something. So doing a research is a very big part of what that idea becomes. I'm always going to really speak in editorial like I'm just I'm speaking more so about editorial right now. But for editorial, I, I do research quite a bit and try to like get an idea of what I'm going to do because I, I'm also sending these things to other people. And, you know, most time the photographer does send a mood board, but sometimes I send my own mood boards as well. It's like 50-50. It just really depends on who I'm working with. Yeah. And if the photographer sends in a mood board to me with like his research or their research, I'll follow with like some additional images of what I think we could also add in. And I think that's the first part of the job really is to like really gather what the research is and try to figure out what we're going to do. And for administrative stuff, I like really, I don't like dealing with administrative part of my job. So I kind of look towards the end a lot of times. It's just not a very fun part, you know? But like I leave a lot of that towards the end for some reason. I'm not really sure why I always do that, but it's always like the last thing I worry about. Yeah. And I'm like, what was the other thing that you said? You said administrative, you said research, and there was something else you said. What was it? I mean, there was time on a set and there was like, if there's like anything else, I guess. I mean, there's research prep, there's yeah, administration. Is there anything else? Well, it goes research, prep, shoot, and then what is, what's the word? It's post shoot. Yeah post shoot is like basically after i've done the shoot you know i have to return the clothes to the to the houses that i've requested them from or the pr people that i'm dealing with you know i have to return those things and i have to kind of so that is really the last end result of whatever i'm doing which is administrative part of it i would i would say you know it's like dealing with the end result that's why i always say i do it towards the end yeah but yeah i mean i feel like generally that's just my routine you know it's like research, prepping, then going, you know, if there's like additional things I need to do, like I'll have them in between. And like, also like another casting, you know, dealing with casting a model. If I'm not doing a, a talent, like you also have to cast a model. So like, there's that idea, you know, and you're dealing with that part a lot, because you want to find the right face and who you're going to shoot, you know, and can they like give you what you're thinking about for your idea, you know? A significant and sometimes challenging part of being a professional is making money. As most of us know, the awe-inspiring editorial work often doesn't pay that well, so I was curious to hear how Jermaine manages that. I'm not going to say I'm very good with finances, but I don't really put myself in tough spots with finances because my mother always like really told me she, you know, she's very like big on like making sure you're set up for in case of any emergencies. And one thing my mother has always told me is make sure you have something put away for rainy days and rainy days meaning that, you know, we've just gone through a very long rainy day. We've just gone through COVID where no one was working. Yeah. And I didn't, I listened to my mother, but like, I also 
would say I don't always listen to her. But when COVID happened, I really thought about it. And I was like, wow, like she's actually right. This is a rainy day. This is what she's talking about. Because we don't really see it. We've never gone through such an experience where we've noticed that we've had to like not work for five to five months, you know, or six months, basically a year without knowing that we're also not from like, we're not wealthy necessarily, or we don't come from like a very good family stature of money, you know, but what my mother told me really clicked in my head. And I've always had her in the back of my mind whenever I like deal with money. So I think for me, I say that I try to make sure I'm thinking smarter in terms of finances. And one of the things also is like, I've always choose to do a more of a money job in terms of like even assistant like when I'm assistant I I try to work with people that are working on, on a money job meaning that I'm getting paid more money for the job that I'm doing rather than an editorial which you don't really get anything as an assistant yeah so like I always prioritize a job that is going to be a better paycheck because it's you know like you want to have money you don't want to be without money it's something you need to survive really but I've always tried to take the things that are going to pay better. I won't say that that's necessarily true, but most of the times I would, I like to put myself in the space where I'm making enough money where I could not really worry for a couple of months if something happened, you know? But finance is a really big part of this job in terms of you really put a lot of your own money out into making, making it. Okay. There's a, A couple people who may tell you, like, being a stylist is very expensive. It's one of the most expensive jobs, apart from being a photographer, you know, because photographers have to, like, really spend a lot of money on equipment and post-production and, like, things like that. But a stylist also have to spend that same, probably more money, because just to even put together these shoots and to get a messenger and to, like, you know, like, buy these things for these shoots that you're doing it costs a lot of money. Like it's not very easy to like get a shoot done in terms of finances. You know, you could spend like, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars on prepping a shoot for yourself. It's really expensive at times. Like I have friends who have spent so much money doing one shoot and I'm like, Oh my God, like that's insane. You know, because for me, I personally always try to like not spend so much money because I'm like, I don't know, like I'm just not willing to like really give that much money away into something that it's kind of like, it's me protecting myself from waste, I would say. And when you say there's all these different costs, like what are some of those costs? Because I assume like for some clothing and and accessories and stuff, you can also, you like pull in, right? You just, you like, you can borrow. Well, the main cost behind that is that for editorial, I am paying for shipping. I'm paying for a messenger I'm paying for someone to pick it up. So that's a lot of where the cost has come from. Shipping internationally is very expensive. You could pay five to six hundred dollars for one shipment to come to you, meaning that one brand is sending you clothes. That's already six hundred dollars that you have to pay either to return it or to ship it. You know, you have to pay one way most of the time, or some people have to pay both ways because some brands don't have the budget to ship things internationally. But you are shipping something. That's where a lot of the money really does come from. You know, it's like you're paying for a messenger in New York City, like you're paying maybe 60 bucks to pick one bag up. These are things that are very pricey and they add up. So if you're, if I'm requesting, from 50 places, 50 different things or 50 different companies. Yeah. Just think about that cost that is being added up. And that's why it takes so much money to really do this job is because you're paying for the service of getting it to you. Hey friends, you're listening to the creative voyage podcast. We're in the middle of this episode. So it's time for a short break. If you like this podcast, I'm confident you're going to enjoy the Creative Voyage Monthly Edit, a newsletter for which every month I ask a different creative professional to curate 10 brief recommendations of cool things to inform and inspire, including books, articles, products, portfolios, podcasts, and more, and deliver it exclusively to your inbox. It's a newsletter curated by creatives for creatives. To sign up, visit creative.voyage slash newsletter. Thanks, everyone. Let's get back to the show. 
As creative professionals, we're often met by obstacles and challenges alongside our path. And how we respond in those moments is one of the determining factors of our success. I believe Roy T. Bennett was right when he said, When things do not go your way, remember that every challenge, every adversity, contains within it the seeds of opportunity and growth. I've asked Jermaine about the professional challenges he was facing currently and throughout his career. In New York, for me, I think there's too many of us. That's a very big challenge in terms that, you know, having so many options doesn't really ever get you a job all the time because you're being compared to so many different people that are doing your same job. And, you know, it's whoever have the better relationship or whoever have the better book or whoever worked with a better photographer, whoever have the most follower on Instagram. So a lot of these challenges that myself is currently faced in has to deal with a lot of these things combined. It's a really taking a very big part in your job. Because just having, I don't know, like if you have been freelance also is a big thing. And just everyone is hunting for the same job, you know, whether it's like, oh, like a client is trying to like get someone for the cheapest possible. And, you know, you won't go down in rate, you know, so like the jobs end up going to the person that's going to work for the lowest. Mm -hmm. Things like these are very big challenges that we are facing. And I feel like it's kind of hard to get out of them. Also, knowing that clients are not really trying to like help you in the way that they want so much out of you, but like they're not really giving you the compensation for what you're doing all the time. And I'm not saying this is all clients. I'm just saying it's happening a lot more with some clients. And I'm not really sure Mm -hmm. why is it okay for you to like not want to pay someone when you have to pay your normal employees and your normal employees is doing just about the same work as someone that you're hiring freelance, you know? So it's like, what is our difference in job? We're sometimes maybe doing more work because we're trying to help sell your products, you know, at the end of the day. Yeah. So it's a really like hard spot. But like, I think my main challenge being here in New York is just that there's so many people that's doing what I'm doing in terms of the job title, but not necessarily creating the same exact content that I'm creating. I, I, so I, I can't really say we're we're much the same, but it's also there's other things that's going into play yeah. around that area, whether it's your Instagram followers, you know, who's going to like give the brand a little bit more push, you know, like just a lot of these things really do take place now, you know, and I've always noticed it, but it's, it's getting more apparent that these things are just happening more frequently than possible. Yeah, yeah, the, it is, I mean, Creative industry and creative jobs are booming, and but there's also, I mean, more and more people, young people entering the market. So it's, it is a competitive place to be. I mean, in general, and I, and I can imagine in a place like uh, New York, how are you going about it? Because I mean, one one thing is, as you mentioned, that race to the bottom in a sense, where yeah, client kind of doesn't care about having like a standard maybe on a market. And then a lot of people, because of various reasons, are just willing to drop their prices. But I mean, that's really not a sustainable approach. So I'm curious, yeah, how are you going about it? I mean, I'm, I'm a very firm believer in standing my ground. So I think a lot of how I focus is me understanding that like I'm worth more than what these people are trying to give me. And I really stand my ground. And if Like, listen, if you really want me to work for you, you're going to find the money to pay me to work for you. And if you don't, that means that, you know, like it's your loss. You know, you've reached out to me. I didn't reach out to you. So like, there's a reason you reached out to me. And if you really wanted me, you would find that money. And if you do want me, you will hire me. So I really just am my ground. Obviously, there are some times when I understand that it's not really possible based on what we're doing. And like, you know, like I really put into play how much I'm doing a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Say if I'm doing like 20 looks or whatever, I'll try to like use that as leverage where it's like, well, you're giving me this much to do and you're giving me this rate. This doesn't mix very well because it's like you're giving me so much to do and you're not really trying to pay me for what I'm doing. But I think for me, I just really try my best to like get what I want. And if I have to go a little bit lower, I'll, I'll try. But most times I like have like a base. This is my base rate. This is what I'll do it for. Or this is the lowest I can 
could go for you, you know, but also some of these things you are making up, you're not necessarily making up numbers, but you are making up numbers in a certain way. It really depends. It really depends on the amount of work. So for me, I really say I try to like stand my ground as much as possible. And if I can do the work and it's not as much as I think it is, then I'll do it. But normally, I don't really ever say yes to a lot of things like that. And what are some of the challenges that you might have experienced during your uh, career? Being taken seriously is one of the main challenges that I've come across a lot. And I'm, you know, I'm still be coming across that as well, because, you know, I'm still very young to be doing my own work, I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. I put myself as a full stylist, obviously, because I am. But there is still work that's being done in terms of like, I'm still building my career. I'm not at any state in in my life where I'm going to say my career is at its all time high because it's not, you know, it's not even close right now for me. I'm still building that name, my name inside of for what I want to be and like for who I want to be around. Just like I'm still building that. But I could say being taken seriously is one of the main challenges that I'm, I'm still currently even facing right now because it's like, you know, someone has to take you seriously to believe in what your work is and to believe in what you could do. So that's a very hard thing to like really get over. You really do have to have a lot of confidence in what you're doing mm -hmm. for you to like not pay attention to that is a part of what's going on. Obviously, I'm happy enough that I have some clients that are very sweet to me and they like me. And one of my main things is that I like to be the best person I could be for a client, you know, because I always want them to like, never feel like I'm being a brat or being any what way I always want to feel like I'm being genuine because I'm a genuine person. I work very much so off of energy and who people are. And like, I try to give the same energy I receive, you know, so I really feel like a big part of my life right now is like learning how to just always be positive about like what the results could be and will be because I feel like there's this thing, you know, if you speak to a lot of stylists, you know, like a lot of them started to make their career start to per move forward when they are in their thirties, you know, now a lot of younger people are breaking that barrier, but it's also still a little bit of time before you really become that person that people are like really trusting in you, you know? Yeah. And I think, some stylists that I've noticed and that I've seen, they've really done a good job of like kind of breaking that boundary of saying, well, I'm not going to wait until I'm 30 before I could really all happen for me. I'm going to like push, push, push until it happened. So that's the very big thing that I think a lot of people should really pay attention to is that you may not make it right away because it doesn't really happen for everyone else at the same time. But if you really do pay your dues and like do these things, it will come. And I've speak to a lot of people that I've worked with and people that I currently still work with, you know, and I've kind of like getting advice from them still, you know, and what to do and how to kind of move forward. And it's always the same thing, you know, just it's going to come with time, you know, just find who you are, find what your work should be. All the same kind of topics that I'm, I'm talking about, it's what everyone else tells me, you know. And I'm very thankful for everyone that I've worked with and like currently work with because it's also like a very big thing for me to be with these people. You know, I'm around a lot of different people. So having that support from them in different ways is very encouraging, you know. And it is like a long game. And that's, I think, really important to like remember in, in any creative industry. Of course, there are like outliers who are incredibly talented and at the same time they get like lucky Uh, with a certain like break and maybe they're younger at the time but most often it really is like a long run and there isn't like a prescription of like okay do this and in two years you're going to be there or in five years or ten exactly there's no subscription or no like no way for you to know if you're going to make it right away or possibly like this is a game that you're going to play it's not a game but it is kind of a game that you have to really play and be good at and over time the results of you playing that game will come to you. And a lot of people don't really understand that. And also that's the next thing, you know, even when you go back to like someone young that's coming into industry, they really don't ever understand that part of the game because they're, they're so hesitant to get what they want or to get where they want. They forget that it's also like you coming into this industry After six months of working as a freelancer, you are not entitled to necessarily do your own work. You're not really entitled to like 
push your own work and like say, I should be getting this. No one's entitled to most of these things. We have to work to get there. You know, it's like we work to get a promotion at any normal job. Like we have to work to get a promotion and being a freelancer or being a creative, you know, like we're working towards it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It really does take time. And, and I think maybe part of an issue can be this in, in some sense in our modern lives, we manage to like smooth out some things and feel like, oh, you know, like I can go online and order whatever this cup and it's going to come tomorrow. And it's like it's instant satisfaction in some sense. And I feel like it can almost become like a mindset that everything in life is like that. And if it's not, there's something wrong either with you or with the other person. Yeah. Where I think in most cases, it really, it is a long game and patience and pushing. There is no patience currently in the world. As you could see from after COVID, a lot of people you could tell do not have patience for anything. You know, people, I don't know. It's like going to Starbucks and expecting your coffee to be ready one, like 30 seconds after you order it. You know what I'm saying? These are things that, people are not used to because we live in a society that tells us that we need things now rather than we should wait for it. It's also like a reason why, you know, a lot of our planet is in turmoil is because we want these things to move faster. And we forget that moving faster mean that you're, you're also damaging something else, you know, like something else is going to go wrong because your people are trying to get you this faster, you know, faster is not always better. Yeah. Faster is not always better for anyone. And that's like, what is it? The bunny and the turtle. Like faster is never really better. It's just, you're just faster. You're not necessarily better. Yeah, exactly. It's just one dimension. At this point in our conversation, I was curious to hear about Jermaine's thoughts on the heated topic of sustainability in fashion and how he sees his role in that domain. I think it's like really hard for me to see any change in fashion just because I've I've worked in it for so long and I'm not saying it's not possible, but I think the rate that we're going where brands are making all of these things that necessarily are not really selling, they're just creating them just to create them and there's no customer to buy them. Then they go on this extreme markdown and then someone buys them and put in their closet, but never wear it. It's just such a waste. We don't need, let me see how many seasons do we have a year? We have, we have spring, we have summer, We have fall, we technically have winter. So that's four seasons right there, right? Spring, summer, and fall, winter is technically separated into four seasons at the end of the day, if you think about it. Then you have resort, you have pre-fall, you may have pre-spring. That is about eight collections a year or six collections a year. No one needs that many clothes. Think about it. You generally will wear the same clothes, maybe the same pant two times a week, maybe three. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of people who do that. They don't really care about wearing a different pant every single day or a different, sh- well, shirt. Sure, yeah. But like, you know, like there's some things that you could wear multiple times. Who needs this many clothes, you know? And it's, it's also just, if we're creating all these pre-collections, who are the customers that are really buying all of these pre-collections, you know? Because the pre-collections becomes the main problem. It's like people don't really want to like, think they have to wear one season throughout the entire season they want to feel like they've already entered into a new state of another collection Mm -hmm. which essentially is the same thing it's the same collection just it's like a little watered down you know it's it's not even really a great collection yeah but i feel like a lot of brands should really i also thought during this time a lot of brands during covid would kind of like stop doing a runway show for the season, just take a season off and just focused on next year and really push next year to be better. And I did not see that. I just saw brands doing the same things, you know, like we didn't need to do a show season this year because it's also you're endangering other people based on you wanting to like sell. It's okay if you're not going to make money for this season because you're also probably getting like a government check that's going to help you because you've had so much losses for the year. And I feel like companies take so much advantage of these things where it's like, you don't really need to do this much. You could just really pull back in a little bit. I know Gucci recently said they were going to cut their amount of collections that they produce per year, which was very nice because Gucci has such a big runway show. It's literally 100 looks each show they have. 
And for you to have that many clothes going down a runway, it's insane. And that's that was them doing about like six seasons per year or like four to five seasons per year. That's a lot. Yeah. That's just a lot of waste. So I really feel like brands need to pull back on what they're producing and maybe really think about, do you really need a pre-collection anymore? Should we just not move forward with just two collections a year again? We don't really need this many clothes. It's like no one's really wearing it all. It's kind of like there's also like the next idea. Some brands should really just go, meaning that they should just close down because we don't really need some brands. Some of these brands, you're you're not really selling anything. Yeah. But yeah, I, I really think it's time for people to stop creating this many things that we don't need. And it's not only even fashion. It's just globally. In terms of every industry needs to pull back on what we are producing for the world. We either need to produce something that's amazing or just not produce anything at all. It's like technology. Technology doesn't necessarily release. Like we don't get a new iPhone every six months. We get an iPhone every every year or every two. Well, now it's every year, I guess. But like, you know, every year a new iPhone comes out, which is it's not necessarily like smart to do every year. Every two years will kind of be better. But I guess people need to still sell. So I understand like you, your company needs to move forward. But if we don't get an iPhone for two years, we're not going to die. You know what I mean? Like the previous iPhone still works. Yeah, exactly. You can usually use an iPhone for at least two, three years. Yeah. Two to three years. I mean, they slow it down. They slow it down after two years. But two to three years is still pretty fine to have a phone. You know, like your phone's not really going to not do anything it was doing before. But it's also the next problem of like the world demands the latest and the newest things. And this is what comes into play of why we have this issue. It's because people create this need for things. And it's not only up to companies to say, we need to stop this. It's also up to people to say, we don't want this anymore. It's a two-sided thing. It's from companies and it's also from people because if companies said they weren't going to make this anymore then you're going to have people go well why aren't you doing this anymore this is not fine we want this you know it's like these problematic things that we encounter yeah and i mean i think a lot of companies would defend themselves that it is like a market thing and there's supply and demand and like if if there was no demand they wouldn't supply it and in that sense i think it is a very good observation that it is two-sided and i think it is on all of us to try to do something and yeah, change in some ways the ways that we've been doing some things. How do you see your role in that? Because as you said, and and I can also think about myself, like I get excited about certain things. You're excited about like clothes. Some other people are excited about the latest like gadget. There's that like kind of passion, which means something. Yeah. And then how do you like pair that with this other topic that we've been talking about, kind of slowing down and yeah, not producing that much? I think, For me personally, in my normal life, I try not to actually buy really many pieces of clothes per year. And this is just me knowing that I already have like a lot of clothes that I've sometimes even not worn, you know, like there's still things that I have in my closet that I haven't never worn for 10 years, you know, and I'm like, wait, I bought this so long ago. So like right now I have this mentality of like to get a, a bit of understand about myself, I'm a very... I like basics and I'm very basic in terms of what I buy for myself. Like I like standard things, meaning that I love to have a good pair of black trousers. You know, I may have 10 pairs of black trousers in different fits, but I love to have very essential things, meaning that I always have like a nice white tee, a black tee, like a black pan, a nice pair of jeans, a basic sneaker. There's just a lot of things that I, when I buy them, I buy them with the intent that I will wear them for as long as possible. And I will not need to get something new because unless it's like really something amazing, I won't really get it. Like per season, I may buy three pieces of designer things or maybe less, you know, and that's, that's quite a bit small. That's a small bit of thing for someone that works in fashion, to be honest, Mm -hmm. to buy three pieces of designer things. is like kind of nothing compared to what other people would necessarily buy, you know, but I'm very much, I'll go to Uniqlo and, you know, even though Uniqlo is not the best place to go in the world. And I'm going to say, because they are a fast retail company, there's just some things that I feel like I don't want to pay a hundred bucks for a t-shirt. I just uh, paying 20 bucks is more better for me because it's also just like, I won't feel like if that t-shirt gets messed up, 
I won't really have any regrets, you know, because it was only 20 bucks. But buying something that's 100 bucks or more, I just don't know if I want to commit that much money to something that I don't really believe in necessarily, you know? Yeah. yeah. But I try to like do my part in terms of not shopping as much anymore. And I think that's what I've, I've been trying to stop is like stop wasting because it's also like me buying every season is going to tell someone that, oh, we need to make more. We need to make more. And I don't really necessarily think we need more. I think we need less. But I think that's the, I mean, what else am I doing? I feel like that's my main thing is calm down on the shopping, you know, buy things that are not common to environments anymore. I'm trying to be as good as possible about what I'm buying. But it's also so hard because a lot of these companies really do lie about what they're doing to their products, you know? So it's like, you never really know who's telling the truth. Yeah, and then from what you were describing now, it's also very, uh, let's say, like a personal thing when it comes to instilling that in your work. I assume it gets a little bit harder because if you're mentioning like you have to pull in this many clothes and have this many looks and all these different things, like how can you in those instances instill some of these like things that we talked about? One of the best ways for me to instill is actually pulling back on what I'm doing in a way. I mean, no one needs five racks of clothes, you know, like I know I don't need that many clothes to get my job done. But mm -hmm. for me, I mean, a mindset of that I've always had, to be honest, I am kind of like a very tight edit person, meaning that I'll get the best edit of clothes as possible. And if I have the best edits confirmed for me, I won't really need to do anything else. I don't really want to get more because more doesn't mean good, you know. Yeah. But I think I've been trying to follow this thing where it's like, I just need to get what I need rather than get more to impress anyone there's instances where you may need more because that, uh, you're working with some, a talent you know and like a lot of things come into play when you are working on an editorial shoot or when you're working with a talent because especially a talent you want people to feel comfortable so you get more in case they don't feel comfortable with your idea mm -hmm. so there is instances where you, you can actually pull back and then there are some that you really can't but in instances for me when i'm doing a full editorial i've tried to like pull back a little bit on what i'm requesting because also it's like i don't have the money to ship this many things from around the world to come in you know if it's not here in new york yeah. so i try my best to like kind of simplify what my edit should be I and mean, i think moving forward i i want to actually like just get what i really really need and if it's possible because there's other moments where it's not possible, you know, also like there's times when someone confirms something for you and it doesn't come. So you really have to set yourself up in other ways. But I think to be a stylist is to understand that you may encounter a problem and that's is why we work how we do. But I think a lot of people don't really edit as best as they can because I've, I've worked with both types of people. I've worked with people who are really edited and people who don't like to edit. They'll edit the bare minimum, but they're not like a big editor, meaning that they try to take everything just because they don't feel safe about something. Yeah. But I think that's just my goal for myself is to kind of like just get what I need, which I've always practiced. But I think after COVID, I've been trying to practice a lot more because I'm not really shooting a lot of editorials right now just because it's a little bit weird to get clothes and like, you know, magazines are also like trying to figure out like what they're doing because they've also lost like a lot of advertisers. There's just so many things that's happening right now where I'm kind of taking a break from doing editorials too much and just doing what I really need to do because I just don't feel like it's really working out right now. You know, I feel like we have to really think about what's going to happen in the future, meaning like in the next two months, in the next month what's happening we don't know yet yeah so we have to just put a hold on things by having this be the first episode related to fashion styling i wanted to get an even better understanding of it through the lens of germaine's experience here we discuss the power of collaboration and the continual pursuit of finding your voice we began our investigation by talking about one of my favorite germaine's projects the sophisticated staples an editorial he created together with the photographer Mackay Carter. At the time, I wanted to really do a shoot, and I reached out to a friend at a magazine, which wasn't the same magazine technically, but I made a mood board based on that shoot, and I asked Mackay to do it with me because I was like, I really want to do this shoot. I came across these beautiful references that I was like, 
from a great photographer, Malik Sidibi. And I was like, oh my God, I really love this, you know? And at the time, I'm still trying to find myself during this time, you know, like still happening. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and you know, I reached out to Makai and I was like, oh, hey, I would love to really do this project with you. And I wanted to be like this. And these were the references. I, I sent him references and he was like, okay, cool. Like we could do this. And, you know, we worked together. I had someone cast. I had this guy cast for me. My Actually, I had my boyfriend do my cast in. And he, okay, sorry, I don't like to like put him out there sometimes because he's also just like, oh, but he casted, <laughs> I had him do the casted and, you know, like I was like, hey, I want five boys and I had him deal with that. I got an LOR from the magazine, which is a responsibility letter. And I started to like request, like I had a friend help me with requesting and we started to request all of these things. And I was getting a lot of confirmations on like everything that I was getting. And it was just perfect because the idea behind the shoot was kind of like, you know, we wanted to put like black men in the space where it's like, we've seen black men in these spaces before, but I also think you don't really see them very often in these. I don't know what the word is, but for me, it's special because that's not how I normally see myself. I don't see myself as wearing like a nice tailor and suit all the time. But I wanted to put these boys in a space where they were like cool looking boys, you know, and they were kind of wearing like these amazing outfits where it's just like, oh, my God, I would never see someone wearing that. But you look so amazing in it, you know, and like just even in terms of the patterns I use or like the suits I use, like it was very strong suit in, you know, and tailoring pieces. But basically, the idea started to come along and I worked probably two days getting everything in. After the in- initial request, mm-hmm. I took two days to finally get all the clothes in. I, I think I definitely missed a few things, but I had so many pieces of clothes. I had like three racks or four racks worth of clothes that I got for these five boys. Mm-hmm. And we took a while to get there. My assistant and I started to like put everything. We we had to call an Uber. We had to call a bigger Uber car. And we literally took two cars actually because it was so many things i got shipped to me it was just so many pieces there were just too much to like explain and i got to the studio the studio was quite small it was quite really weird i didn't know it was so small but we started to set up and as we were setting up we were having we started to have the boys get groomed by groomer and I don't know. It's for me, that moment was a little bit stressful. I think the stressful part of it was that I had so much clothes to pick from and I wasn't seeing all the clothes. And in my head, I had ideas of what brands I wanted to use because of specific things that I got from them. Mm -hmm. But at the end, I couldn't see a lot of the clothes because there were just not enough space to put everything out. We started off with like one guy, we got him dressed and then we had a light test. But After that, we kept rolling. As we were going, we were creating these pictures and we were like, you know, why don't we do these two guys here? Or why don't we do... I was like pairing everything. So this was basically a very big shoot for me because, you know, it's like, it's a pitch. And I brought my... I asked Makai to do with me, which, you know, we're collaborating on this idea, you know? So like, it has to be a 50-50. And, you know, even at a time, one of the boys that we had confirm for the shoot he actually didn't show up so we had to cast another boy like in an hour and the boy that showed up was actually like he was a very new boy like he never really shot anything before and it was his first shoot and he showed up and i tell you when i tell you i was so happy with him because he's actually like one of my ma- like he's sitting in a chair and he has the glasses on you've probably seen that picture yeah. he's one of the main guys that i was like I love so much just because it was so random that he's just literally started to model and his pictures were quite amazing. You know, he, you could tell he was very shy. He didn't know what to do. He was like, you have to direct him on how to like pose kind of like teaching them what you want out of them. But a lot of my roles on set entails me like kind of directing. I like to direct people because I'm very big on movement and I'm very big on poses. It's like a thing of mine where I like, I love to like direct, but I'm not an art director. I'm just a stylist right now. But a lot of the job was that basically, you know, it's it's like going through every single motion and what pictures are possible to do and where should we do this or what background should we use? Like a lot of this was the job that I did 
during the day on set that day, you know? And then towards the end, there's like a million garment bags of stuff that I had to like help my assistant take back to their office. That was really the end. It was actually a project that you initiated. Yeah. And then it sounds also that it was very, very much like hands-on and very much like a 50-50 collaboration between you and Makai, right? Yeah, yeah. Like there's times where a photographer will reach out to you, but I think a lot of stylists now and today, we all try to like be proactive about our jobs because you can never just rely on someone reaching out to you. You have to kind of make that connection. And I was so happy that uh, Makai did it with me because I actually didn't think he would have done it with me um, initially because I was like, oh, you know, he's probably going to be like, no, he doesn't know me, you know, because I'm very, I'm one of those people that are very sometimes insecure about some things in terms of like, I'm just like, oh, he doesn't know me. I don't think he's going to want to do it. Yeah. But he responded and like, he was like such, such a sweet guy. And I thought the pictures came out amazing. I was so happy with all the pictures. And I really think that shoot out of all all of my shoots, I really do get a lot of comments based on that shoot. And it's quite a happy thing to know that those pictures are such a representation of a part of my work. Because I think a lot of people really do love them. And I've been told that by many different people, you know. And it's always like a eye-opener to see. Like, I'm like, okay. Well, that's quite happy because like, you know, like I really like tried to like get that idea out there and it really did work. I think it's a, yeah, an amazing project. I mean, I came across your work when I was uh, doing research for, for like potential guests earlier this year. As I mentioned in my email, I was planning a trip to New York, which was scheduled just when the kind of Corona outbreak happened. So that didn't happen. And I've seen your work, I think, first in Kinfolk. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, when I went to your website and, and saw this project, uh, I mean, not, not only this project, but this project was one of those that I was like, wow. I really think a lot of, like Kinfolk, that's actually another one of my like favorite pictures I've ever done. And, you know, Waris, I, I, I'm assuming you're talking about the Waris shoot. Yes. But Waris was such an amazing guy. And the thing about that shoot was it was actually a very, very last minute shoot. It was so last minute where it was impo almost impossible to do, but you know I did it and it turned out so beautiful. And just the pictures, the picture of him in a pink sweater was just a beautiful picture. Like I'm insanely, you know, like I've never worked with Zoltan before, mm -hmm. or actually I've worked with Zoltan before because actually someone I used to assist suggested me for that shoot, which I was thankful for. But those pictures turned out so lovely and I was very, very happy with the outcome because it was just like, these are pictures I want to create. They're so simple and beautiful where the image just speaks for itself, you know, and like you don't need a lot of things in an image for it to speak for itself. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about those images was that they were so simple and just the person we were shooting was so amazing. Like Wars is like an amazing man. He's like one of those people where you're just like, wow, you're a cool guy, you know? But I really want my work to kind of always be like that, where it's like, you don't really need much to make something beautiful. It takes like so little to make beautiful images sometimes, you know, like the simplest things make a beautiful image. And I've been really trying to like do that. But I, I feel like also in the current time that we live in, a lot of people are not really into the simpler things anymore because they just want the extreme things or like, you know, it's always has to be so much elements where it's not really necessarily needed, mm -hmm. but this is what people want to see, you know? And I've realized that it's still, I'm still finding a place for me, obviously, but I love what I've been creating and what I'm currently trying to create. And every shoot I've done, I've, I've worked very, very hard to like make it the best it could be. I'm like the kind of person who is very meticulous about every single thing. And even when I'm working with a photographer and be like, hey, we should take also this shot just in case this doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. Like I'm that kind of person, you know, like I want the best results possible. Because when you look at your pictures at the end, you want them to tell a story. And for my work, I'm a very big on storytelling. Because it's like, I love to watch movies, number one. Movies are such big storytellers for me, which it also seen an image in a storytelling way. And someone understanding what the image is telling as a story is kind of like very impressive. You know, if you could understand like a story when you see a magazine, a shoot in a magazine. And I would also say today, you don't really find a lot of 
fashion stories telling stories anymore. They're more like just giving you looks rather than telling you a full story. But maybe 10 years ago to like 20 years ago, those stories that you would find like a W an interview, a Vogue, maybe, I don't know, like all of these older magazines, the Bazaar, they told a lot of stories back then. But today, there's not much story being told anymore. And I think it's because there's so much restraint with advertisers, people wanting to pull back and not spend this much. And, and I get it. We don't want to waste, but it's also like we're kind of missing the reason why there is magazines. Fashion magazines were mostly for storytelling and to really bring the clothes to life. And we're not really getting much life out of the clothes we're seeing anymore. Yeah. So the storytelling elements are just being, been taken away kind of. And I don't know how much uh, how many magazines you look at now, but if you look at a lot of them, it's just you just see clothes and people. You don't really see a story. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever understood that about like looking at it, but when I do look at a magazine now, I don't really see a full story anymore. And, you know, like, I'm also even finding the problem with that because I think a lot of photographers now also, I think some of them have missed the part about storytelling because they've just been so, like, wanting to do fashion, but not really understand that you have to tell a full story sometimes, you know? And, and it, it's everyone. It's stylists, it's photographers, it's everyone. We're all sometimes missing the factors of story. And it's also based on knowledge. Knowledge is a very big part of our job. Like if you have knowledge of what fashion was, you would know that we always tell storytelling. There was always a storytelling, you know? Yeah. And how how do you go about, I guess, developing yourself in that sense? Because you said with some of these shoots and and what you've been doing lately, you're kind of finding your voice, but you're still, of course, searching. And it's like an ongoing process in a way. So I'm curious, how, how do you go about that? Like, where do you get your inspiration? What are your like kind of resources to keep evolving yourself? As of lately, I've been trying to like collect books and books with like amazing imagery and amazing like just things that pictures that are like special. Like yesterday, I actually just bought this book and it was, give me one second. I want to tell you the name of it. Yep. So I just bought this book yesterday and it's Lorna Simpson and that's just the name of the book. And I, you know, I saw it and I was like, and I started to look through it and I was like, wow, these are some amazing images. They're just so beautiful. Like in the layout of how the images are laid out on these pages are, is so special. And I saw it and I was like, oh my God, you know? So like I instantly, I feel like whenever I see a good book now, I get like so inspired because You see things and you kind of, you relate to them in a way, you know, and I think one of my biggest things is like, I like to relate to the books that I'm buying in a way. I like to put myself in those images, maybe, yeah. or kind of like, I say, oh, this image, I'm like seeing one of the images in the book and, you know, I'm like, oh, she looks like she's in like a Prada dress or a Mew Mew dress or like a Gucci dress, you know, like things like that is where I really play around mentally because when I look at a book I kind of see things like there is this one other book that I actually have and it's called Bolton Photos and it's the cover is literally this you know black guy in a glasses and he's in like in a black suit white shirt and I was like wow this is amazing image you know like I get so inspired by just seeing like things like that where I'm just like he's in a simple black suit with a white shirt And the image speaks so loudly, you know? So I think really researching and looking in books is like a big part of my process and how like I get excited for what my next thing may be, you know? It's like kind of researching and recreating those moments, not necessarily recreating the moments exactly to what they are, but kind of taking a note from what the moments that those people created back then were. We've come to the last topic I've discussed with Jermaine. As usual, I've asked him to highlight three pieces of advice based on what he learned so far on his professional journey. One of my first things is your relationships. Your relationships are very important to this job and how you are perceived as a person in the industry. And I think building a relationship is one of the most important part. It's either with a photographer, a makeup artist, a hairstylist, the client, just anyone, always build a relationship because a relationship is important. Never walk into a room and not even say good morning because like that's first of all, that's building a relationship. You walk into a room and someone's like, oh, that person is snobby. Like they didn't even say hi, you know, like always introduce yourself. 
relationships are very important to our job that we're doing and will continue to be important to get our job done. Even in PR, my relationships with some PRs is stronger than others. And that's how I normally get my clothes is because of my strong relationship with some of these people that I've worked with for years, you know, and I've known and I've hanged out with and some of them are my close friends. Those relationships are very important. And that's one. The next thing is build a reference for yourself. If you know what you want your work to be, start to research images and like find the images that re- you relate to and build an archive of references because like references at the end of the day will always make your work more stronger than having no references. I've like done shoots where I've had no references, you know, and, and they turn out great. But like also like I feel like my images really come to life when I've understand what a reference was or understood like where this image could be taken to. And I really think having an archive of imagery that you enjoy and that evokes something to you emotionally is really important. And the third thing is your finances, you know. Before you enter into this industry as, you know, like if you want to break into being a stylist or even just you're leaving your assistant part and you're taking off on yourself on your own, just make sure you're financially, you have like something finance wise, your money is in the right place just because this takes a lot of money to do. And being freelance necessarily means that you may not be work for a couple of weeks, you know, so you always want to have backups. And I think financially, you should be stable before you really indulge yourself in like fully going on your own because you will spend a lot of money to do this job. You will spend quite a bit of money to do this job. It'll come back, but it's over time, you know, so you have to have yourself be ready to not necessarily have finances that you're normally used to. So I think finances is a big part of this and a big idea in what being a stylist is sometimes you just really, really want to like have it together. So those three things I feel like are like the most important things that I could recommend to anyone who is either leaving to be a stylist or, you know, want to break into industry, just gather yourself together in these ways, you know, relationships, finances, and research. Research, these are three big parts of our our job. And I think they're very important topics that people should know about and should understand. Hey, everyone. That's it for this episode. I hope you found it useful. And if you like this podcast, tell a friend. I want to thank Jermaine for coming onto the show. I find his work remarkable and I'm grateful that he was willing to dive deep into the world of fashion styling with me. Links to Jermaine's work and some other things mentioned during the conversation can be found in the show notes at creative.voyage slash podcast. If you love printed matter, do check out our first publication, The Creative Voyage Paper, featuring adopted podcast episodes, three publication exclusive one lesson learned features, and various tips for leveling up. Visit creative.voyage to get your copy. And lastly, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. Until next time, my friends, take care.